please join me in a prayer for illumination. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with renewed hope what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah. It's chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Let us listen to the word of God. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the fire will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave you Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the book of Luke. And it is chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, and then 21 to 22. It's on page 891 in your pew Bible. As the people were in expectation, and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ, John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and I am the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove, and a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. So how about that little baby, huh? <laughs> students, Beth had this great idea. She asked everyone to bring in pictures of their baptism. Our topic was baptism that day. And she wanted us to try and remember details from that day. So who was there? What, what clothes were they wearing? Was, was the child wearing? Who performed the baptism? Did anything interesting happen that day? I loved hearing everyone's stories. And it, Caused me this week to kind of think about my own baptism, or ask 
call my mom and ask about my baptism. So I was baptized in Unionville, Connecticut, April of 1976 at my family's congregational church. I was eight months old. I was baptized by Pastor Todd alongside my cousin Seth. So the biggest decision parents make on the day of their child's baptism is what? What they're going to wear, exactly. <laughs> so my mom that day showed, she said, this blue kind of sweater outfit, thinking it was going to be a nice, cool April day. So by 11 a.m., it was the mid-90s, inside the church, sweat pouring down everyone's face, all inside their clothes, and apparently the blue sweater outfit didn't go too well. That I couldn't wait for that water to get on me. So I'm, I'm amazed by the diversity of baptism in the Christian religion. A couple years ago, Kim and I attended um, a church up in Morristown a few times called Liquid. And on this one particular Sunday, they meet at the Hyatt Hotel in one of their ballrooms. And in the center of the stage was this huge tub of water. And one by one, people came up with these blue t-shirts. And the pastor fully dunked and submerged them in the water. I live in Chicago. I attended a church that would have baptism on Easter morning in Lake Michigan. <laughs> so I think I'm interested with these kinds of baptisms because it's not part of my tradition. It's not really a part of our Presbyterian tradition. I, I would guess, would guess, most of you, a lot of you were baptized as infants. Baptism, it started out as an experience reserved for adults that slowly came to include children and finally infants. So way back in the early church, baptism and the process to be baptized was a serious and a lengthy process. So we have records of baptism in the 4th century, where the one being desired to be baptized spent anywhere from a year to three years prior to their baptism receiving intense instruction from a teacher on the principles of the Christian faith. A year to three years. They went underwent a rigorous examination of the applicant's profession, their marital status, their legal status, make sure everything was above reproach. Their sponsor would keep tabs on them, whether or not they were visiting the sick and caring for the widows. And in the final days leading up to their baptism, in some communities, the bishop would perform daily exorcisms on them. So we could say this. Adult baptisms, they stress the intention and the decision of the individual. Their decision is to be baptized, but the decision to be baptized is a choice they have made in response to God's actions towards them. So our denomination smokes practice kind of baptism is infant baptism. And next Sunday, perfect timing, Micah will be baptized. She's going to be baptized at the Presbyterian Church of Morristown. <laughs> time I'm going to use her as an object lesson, but that's okay. So she'll be baptized, Presbyterian Church of Morristown, and we are very excited. Um, we've purchased, we've got a nice white flowing dress for her to wear, which she's going to look great in. And next Sunday, I will um, hand her over to Pastor Cindy, and she will walk her over to the baptismal font, and she will take water from the baptismal font and pour it on her head. And say, Micah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Cindy might then walk her down the aisle, and she might say, Micah, you are a child of God. And this, this is your community of faith. And I'd say Micah has a couple communities of faith. 
And then she will pass her back to her proud parents. And I was thinking, in that moment, what thoughts I'd be running around Micah's head. And here are a couple that I was thinking about. <laughs> so first, where the heck am I? What just happened? Who is that person in the robe? And then why is there water running down my face? So will Micah remember anything about her baptism? No. Did she make any kind of conscious decision to be baptized? No. Does she strive to live a new life in Christ? No. In that moment, what she wants, she wants a bottle, she wants a fresh diaper, and maybe a little chewy toy that she likes. So, in my own Christian journey, at times I've, I've struggled with through baptism, because there's absolutely no action on the part of the, the baby. There's no choice or decision or desire on the part of the baby. Instead, the parents make the decision for the child to be baptized. So today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. And annually, on this Sunday, we celebrate Jesus' baptism by John the Jordan River. So I have a very simple question for us this morning in this sermon. What might today's reading tell us about baptism? And what more importantly, what does it then tell us about God? So if we are to strip away the parts of today's text that surround Jesus' baptism, so that being John the Baptist's his vision or his expectation or his hope for the Messiah, that the Messiah will come as a, as a judge, one who separates wheat from chaff. We put that aside, and we just zero in on Jesus' baptism. What can it tell us about what happens in baptism? So in Jesus' baptism, the heaven is opened, and God's Spirit comes to Jesus to announce that He is a Son, that He is beloved, that He is well-pleased in Him, or maybe we could say that God delights in him. There are many different interpretations we can find of baptism in the New Testament. The waters of baptism wash us clean. Baptism ushers us into the church where we now belong to a community of faith. Those interpretations are all there, and they have a lot to say and offer us. But for today, our scripture describes a God who comes to Jesus. It describes God coming to him and God declaring that he belongs to God, that he is loved, that he is accepted. In this reading, it is Jesus who experiences the Spirit descending on him, and it is Jesus who hears these words of love and acceptance. But for me, personally, I feel much more comfortable hearing those words spoken to Jesus than hearing them spoken to me. I find that much easier. Yet in our baptism, these words are spoken to us. The heavens open for us, the Spirit descends on us, and those words of love and acceptance are directed towards us. What I have learned, and I am learning about infant baptism, is that it tells us not about our actions or our response to God. Instead, <coughs> infant baptism tells us all about God's actions towards us. It tells us that God always comes to us first, and then we respond. There is a response to our baptism. There is a calling that we, we live into a new life in Christ. One of the ways we respond to our baptism is by allowing God to say to us, you are my beloved. It's one thing to hear those words spoken. It is another to actually believe and trust those <coughs> words and allow them to penetrate deep into our soul. <coughs> There's nothing magical about the water that we use in baptism. It wouldn't matter if it's tap water from the bathroom across from the office, or if it's actual water from the Jordan River. 
Well, that would be really cool if it was actual water from the Jordan River. <laughs> but baptism points to a reality that already exists. It points to a gift that has already been given to us. The day after Christmas, Kim and Mike and I went down to Florida to see her parents. And they have this small little pool right outside the back door. So one day we said, let's give Mike her first pool experience. So we got her in her little swimming diaper that you're supposed to put on. And brought her over to the first steps of the pool. And kind of grabbed her, her hands and slowly let her feet kind of dangle on that first step and get used to the water. And then I grabbed her by the waist and went down into the pool. And I kind of got her above water up to her, her tummy, and I could, as she kind of dipped in, I could see her, like, her eyes got really big, and I could, like, hear her breathing, kind of like, what is going on here? And then she started to settle in, started to kick in the waters, and she got used to it, and I started to take her around, and this big smile came on her face, and, and I could... I would guess that in that moment she was thinking something like, these waters are nice. I could do this. I could swim in these waters every 